Welcome to this lecture on validity and introduction to screeners. Let's begin with the significance of measurement in psychology. Measurement in psychology is not just about numbers. It's about understanding human behavior, cognition, and emotion in quantifiable terms. It's this process of assigning numerical values to abstract concepts like intelligence, personality, and motivation. We've all studied various models of psychometrics, including classical test theory and item response theory. These theories rely on measurement to determine the underlying constructs that guide human behavior. Think about the essence of clinical diagnoses or educational assessments or even evaluating job candidates. Without proper measurement, we would have only subjective judgments and opinions, which ultimately can lead to biases and inconsistencies. Measurement turns vague concepts into something tangible. By quantifying abstract ideas, we enable comparisons and contrasts. We begin to see patterns and correlations leading to new theories and models. So for example, in trauma research, accurate measurement of PTSD symptoms helps researchers understand the underlying triggers and coping mechanisms, which leads to targeted therapies and interventions. In studying violent offenders, psychometric tools measure risk factors and personality traits, and that enhances our understanding of the pathways to criminal behavior. Measuring social responsiveness and communication skills in individuals with autism enables researchers to develop interventions tailored to different severity levels. With measurement, we can predict future outcomes or behaviors. For example, assessing a student's learning style can guide personalized education plans, which would improve their academic performance. Predictive tools can identify individuals at higher risk for development developing trauma-related disorders, which would allow for early intervention. Risk assessment instruments can predict the likelihood of reoffending among violent criminals, guiding sentencing and parole decisions. Also, early screening and assessment of autism can predict developmental challenges, enabling early therapeutic support. Clinicians and educators alike rely on well-measured assessments to make decisions. These decisions can influence treatments, interventions, or even career guidance. For instance, trauma-informed assessments guide therapists in choosing a appropriate treatment plans for survivors, such as CBT or EMDR. Psychologists working with violent offenders use assessments to design rehab programs targeting specific behavioral and emotional issues. And in the field of neuropsych, educators and therapists use assessments to create individualized educational plans, which are known as IEPs, and they're tailored to a child's unique needs and autism spectrum disorders. Reliability refers to the consistency of measurement. If a test is reliable, it can be trusted and it would yield the same results under the same conditions. It's the building block for validity of any test or study. Reliable PTSD assessments ensure that trauma survivors receive consistent and accurate diagnoses, and that's going to lead to proper care. Consistency in evaluating violent offenders ensures fair and just legal proceedings and treatment planning. And again, in the field of neuropsych, reliable autism assessments provide a trustworthy foundation for long-term treatment and support planning, and that's going to enhance the lives of individuals and their families. In essence, the importance of measurement and psychology cannot be overstated. It's this bridge between the theoretical concepts and the empirical evidence. And without it, our understanding would remain abstract. And then the application of psychological principles would be haphazard at best. As I previously stated, reliability refers to consistency and repeatability of a measure. A reliable measure yields similar results across different instances or under various conditions. Validity concerns whether the measure truly captures the concept it is intended to measure. A valid measure not only produces consistent results, which is reliable, but accurately reflects the underlying construct. Some key distinctions from reliability is the nature of the concepts. Reliability focuses on the consistency of the measure. Validity concentrates on the accuracy and appropriateness of the measure. For evaluation, reliability is assessed through methods like test retest, internal consistency, and iterator reliability, whereas validity is evaluated through construct, content, face, criterion, concurrent, and predictive validity. There's also interdependence. A measure can be reliable without being valid, meaning it's consistently hitting the same spot off the target. However, a measure cannot be valid without being reliable because validity requires consistent measurement to accurately reflect the construct. Let's look at this target analogy. When something's reliable but not valid, imagine an archer consistently hitting the same spot on a target, but that spot is not the bullseye. The archer is reliable, it's consistent, but it's not valid, it's not accurate. Valid and reliable, now I want you to imagine the archer consistently hitting the bullseye, 
This demonstrates both reliability and validity as the archer's shots are both consistent and accurate. Let's think about this in a applicable sense. Writing items for a depression scale requires more than just crafting questions that seem relevant. The items must consistently measure the same underlying concept, which is depression, across various contexts and populations. Considering validity, even if a confirmatory factor analysis fits the data well, it does not guarantee that the scale actually measures depression. The scale must also accurately reflect the underlying construct of depression. Now let's delve deeper into a familiar and related concept. Validity is about accuracy, and because it tells us whether a test measures what it's supposed to measure, without validity, even the most reliable test is rendered meaningless. In the assessment of traumatic brain injuries, epilepsy, or a stroke, the validity of a neuropsychological test ensures that the observed cognitive and behavioral deficits are directly linked to the neurological conditions. Invalid measures can lead to misdiagnosis or inappropriate treatment plan. Valid assessments for disorders like OCD, body dysmorphic disorder, or hoarding disorder are vital in distinguishing these disorders from other anxiety disorders or depressive disorders. Invalid tests might overlook key symptoms, and that's going to hinder appropriate treatment. In forensic psych, validity is paramount in evaluating criminal behavior, competency to stand trial, or eyewitness testimony. Inaccurate assessments can have severe legal implications, leading to unjust sentencing or release. Validity in cross-cultural assessments ensures that tests are meaningful across different cultural contexts. Cultural biases and assessments can lead to misinterpretations of behaviors and symptoms, which potentially undermine therapeutic relationships. Construct validity is a critical and multifaceted consideration in scientific research, dealing with the degree to which a test or measurement method accurately assesses the theoretical construct or concept is intended to measure. Unlike concrete or observable phenomena, constructs are often abstract in nature, making them inherently difficult to measure accurately. Some characteristics of construct validity, there's a theoretical foundation. It's grounded in theoretical understanding and ensures that the underlying theory behind a construct is accurately captured in measurement. There's also this dynamic process. Construct validity is not a one-time event, but a continuous process of refinement and validation through empirical evidence. It's also multidimensional. Many constructs have multiple dimensions or facets, which adds complexity to the measurement and requires careful consideration. The assessment of construct validity is especially crucial in disciplines like psychology, education, sociology, and even healthcare, where many essential concepts cannot be directly observed or measured. It's foundational to the scientific method as it impacts the quality and integrity of the research findings. So why is construct validity so vital? It enables researchers to quantify and analyze abstract or latent variables such as motivation, self-esteem, intelligence, and more. Now this opens up vast areas of research that would otherwise be inaccessible. It also helps us avoid research bias. Without proper validation of a construct, biases can occur, and this leads to incorrect interpretations or misrepresentations of the data. Assessing construct validity helps minimize both systematic and random errors. It's also good for facilitating comparative studies. Ensuring construct validity allows for different studies to measure the same constructs, enabling comparisons and meta-analyses. Also, informing practice and policy. In fields like education and healthcare, construct validity ensures that interventions, treatments, or educational practices are based on sound measurements of underlying constructs, leading to more effective and targeted strategies. There are challenges in assessing construct validity. We first have to think about complex constructs having multiple dimensions or facets, which requires careful and nuanced measurement. There's also a lack of direct observation. Since constructs cannot be directly observed, creating valid measures requires a deep understanding of the theoretical foundation of a construct. There's also a potential overlap with other constructs. Discriminant validity is essential to ensure that the construct does not not overlap with other related but distinct constructs, which can lead to confusion or incorrect interpretations. Before continuing more on construct validity, I want to go over types of measurement validity that we'll also talk about. Remember that measurement validity is a critical aspect of any research instrument, ensuring that the tool is accurately measuring what it's supposed to measure. There are four primary types of measurement validity, and each of them serves a distinct purpose in the context of research. 
There's content validity, which assesses whether the test or measurement tool adequately and comprehensively represents the domain or content area it aims to measure. This is common in educational testing, where it's crucial to ensure that a test covers all subject areas being taught. This requires expert judgment, a literature review, and statistical analyses that can be used to evaluate the content validity. Some challenges, overlooking important aspects or including irrelevant content can undermine content validity. We also have face validity and its subjective judgment of whether the test appears at face value to measure what it's intended to measure. It's often used in the preliminary stages of test development to gain initial acceptance from respondents or stakeholders. Superficial examination by non-experts such as participants or laypersons, is usually involved in assessing face validity. Since it relies on appearance rather than rigorous analysis, face validity can sometimes be misleading. Criterion validity evaluates how well the test correlates with specific concrete outcomes or standards that it's supposed to predict. There's two subtypes. There's concurrent validity, which measures how well the test correlates with the currently existing criterion. And there's predictive validity, which is assessing how well the test predicts future performance or outcomes. It's frequently used in employment testing where the goal is to predict job performance. The methods used are typically correlations with known criteria, longitudinal studies, or comparing with established benchmarks. However, identifying appropriate criteria and establishing temporal relationships can be difficult. Now back to construct validity. Remember, this examines how well a test measures the theoretical construct it's intended to measure. There's two subtypes. There's convergent validity, and that's alignment with other measures or similar constructs, and there's discriminant validity, and that's differentiation from measures of distinct constructs. This is essential in psychological, educational, and social sciences to ensure that abstract concepts are accurately measured. Various statistical analyses, pilot studies, expert review, and correlational studies are the methods used to assess for construct validity. However, defining and operationalizing complex constructs can be demanding. Constructs are theoretical concepts that form the foundation of many scientific inquiries, particularly within the fields of psychology, sociology, and education. They offer researchers tools to explore, define, and measure abstract phenomena that cannot be directly observed or measured. Let's look at simple versus complex constructs. Simple constructs are constructs that are narrowly defined and can be easily measured or observed. For instance, hand preference is a simple construct. It's easily assessed by asking participants participants their dominant hand or observing them perform tasks. Some measurement techniques, this could include simple survey questions, direct observations, and straightforward tasks that are often sufficient to assess simple constructs. These simple constructs are often used in basic behavioral studies or foundational research. Complex constructs are multidimensional and require more nuanced and comprehensive measurement techniques. For example, social anxiety is a complex construct, and this encompasses is psychological, physiological, and behavioral dimensions. The measurement techniques for complex constructs include psychometric questionnaires, clinical interviews, observations, and mixed methods. These are common in psychological research, clinical assessment, and educational studies, where constructs such as intelligence, motivation, or personality are investigated. Let's shift to dimensions of a construct. The recognition that a complex construct is made up of several interconnected parts or dimensions adds depth to the under understanding of the construct. This requires theoretical insight, empirical evidence, and often iterative refinement to accurately capture all aspects of the construct. For example, social anxiety. The psychological dimension includes the cognitive aspects such as thoughts, beliefs, and intense fears related to social interactions. The physiological dimension encompasses physical reactions such as increased heart rate, sweating, or trembling during social encounters. The behavioral dimension focuses on observable actions, such as avoidance of social situations, lack of eye contact, or withdrawal from social engagements. But I want you to think about the interactions between these dimensions. Often, dimensions are interrelated, and they influence one another. And this is what adds the complexity of the construct. There are some challenges in understanding constructs. The first is ambiguity. And this is because a lack of clear definition or overlapping with other constructs can create confusion. There's also 
measurement difficulties. Complex constructs may require the development of specialized instruments, which can be time consuming and challenging. And lastly, we have to think about cultural considerations. Constructs may manifest differently across diverse cultural contexts, and this requires careful consideration in both definition and measurement. The validation of a construct is a complex and critical process in research methodology involving several key steps. The process begins with the clear and specific definition of the construct. What does it represent? How does it differ from other related constructs? This requires extensive literature review and theoretical understanding. Many constructs have multiple dimensions that contribute to their complexity. Identifying these dimensions helps in understanding the multifaceted nature of the construct. This involves translating theoretical concepts into measurable elements. How will you measure the construct? What instruments or scales will be used? This step ensures that the concept can be empirically tested. Care must be taken to avoid pitfalls such as omitted variable bias, where an important variable might be left out, or information bias, which may occur if the measure doesn't accurately capture the construct. When you're creating measures, this involves designing specific questions, scales, or tools that directly measure the construct. Attention must be given to language, format, and context to ensure that the questions are both clear and relevant. Questions or scales must align with the identified dimensions of the construct, ensuring that all aspects of the construct are measured. The measure must focus solely on the specific construct, avoiding overlap with related but separate constructs. For example, when measuring social anxiety, care must be taken not to confound this with shyness or introversion. Before full-scale implementation, measures should be pre-tested in pilot studies to gauge effectiveness, clarity, and reliability. For statistical evaluation, utilizing statistical tools such as factor analysis can help in understanding how well the questions or scales align with the underlying construct. This aids in evaluating both convergent and discriminant validity. Construct validation is not a one-time process. Continuous evaluation and refinement are necessary, especially if the construct or its theoretical understanding evolves over time. Involving experts in the field provides valuable insights and validation from those who have in-depth understanding of the construct. Submitting the measures for peer review can further ensure validity and provide constructive feedback for refinement. Construct validity is often assessed through two key types that provide a holistic view of how well a measure is functioning with respect to theoretical expectations. Convergent validity measures the extent to which the assessment aligns with other measures or similar constructs. It helps to confirm that the measure is indeed related to other variables and constructs that it's theoretically supposed to correlate with. This involves comparing the test results with other existing measures that are believed to be assessing the same construct. So for example, if you're testing a new measure of self-esteem, you would expect it to correlate highly with existing validated self-esteem skills. This demonstrates that the measure is consistent with theoretical expectations regarding relationships and similarities between the construct and other related constructs. Selecting appropriate existing measures for comparison and determining the strength of correlation that's required to support convergent validity is one of the challenges Challenges. The resolution is collaboration with subject matter experts and comprehensive literature review that can guide appropriate selection and expectation setting. Discriminant validity, on the other hand, assesses the degree to which the measure is unrelated or very weakly related or even negatively related to measures of distinct constructs. It helps to confirm that the measure is not associated with variables and constructs with which it theoretically should not be associated. Comparing the test results with other existing measures that are believed to assess different constructs constructs is the method for discriminant validity. For instance, if you're testing a new measure of introversion, you would expect it to be negatively correlated or not correlated at all with the validated extroversion scale. Differentiating between closely related constructs and identifying appropriate measures for comparison that are genuinely unrelated is a huge challenge of discriminant validity. And the resolution is to have an in-depth understanding of the theoretical underpinnings of the constructs in consultation with experts that can guide the selection of comparison measures. The combination of convergent and discriminant validity offers a robust approach to validating a construct. So to some, convergent validity shows that the measure is correlated with what it should be, and this strengthens confidence in its accuracy. And discriminant validity shows that the measure is not correlated with what it shouldn't be, reinforcing its specificity. Together, these aspects provide a comprehensive validation strategy that supports the accuracy, precision, and uniqueness of the construct measure. 
Testing construct validity is a multifaceted process that requires a combination of research methodologies. The first one is pilot studies. These serve as a preliminary investigation to evaluate the feasibility, reliability, and validity of the intended measures. The method is having a small sample of participants to be selected, and then the study is conducted as a trial run. The main benefits is that it helps in identifying potential problems in the research design, questionnaire items, and scaling. Modifications can can be made before a full-scale study to ensure better accuracy and validity. You also test it with correlational analyses. For convergent validity, which measures the extent to which scores on the test are related to scores on other tests of the same or similar constructs, a strong positive correlation would suggest good convergent validity. And discriminant validity checks that the scores on the test are not related or very weakly related to scores on tests of different constructs. So you would want a low or negative correlation, which would indicate good discriminant validity. You also use regression analyses. This assesses whether the measure predicts outcomes that it theoretically should predict. And the method is multiple regression, and these models can include other variables to control for potential confounders. The interpretation at the end would be significant predictive power supporting the claim of construct validity. Construct validity can be compromised by several threats. Poor operationalization is one of them. And the issue is that the lack of a clear and precise definition and measurement can result in random or systematic error. This may cause information bias, leading to erroneous conclusions. Some mitigation strategies are clearly defining the construct and using a rigorous methodology adhering to previously established standards where applicable. Another threat to construct validity are experimenter expectancies. The issue is that researchers' biases and expectations can unintentionally influence the results. The impact is that it may lead to biased interpretations and skewed outcomes. And the mitigation strategies strategies here are researcher triangulation using blinded protocols and implementing double-blind experimental designs to minimize personal biases. And lastly, there's subject bias. The issue here is that participants' own biases and expectations may influence their behavior and responses. And the impact is that it can cause responses that are aligned with perceived demands or social desirability rather than genuine reactions. Now here, you would want to utilize masking or blinding techniques, or you can even provide cover stories, and this carefully helps you craft instructions to reduce demand characteristics and other response biases. The integrity of research relies on careful attention to both the testing methodologies and potential threats to construct validity. Now, this is why you need to embrace robust pilot studies, statistical analyses, and strategies to mitigate known threats, because you want to be able to fortify the validity of your construct. And understanding and addressing these complexities contributes to the reliability and replicability of findings, enhancing the overall quality of the scientific inquiry. Content validity evaluates how well an instrument, like a test, covers all relevant parts of the construct it aims to measure. Here, a construct is a theoretical concept, theme, or idea. In particular, one that cannot usually be measured directly and are more difficult to measure. Eating disorders, for instance, consists of several dimensions and cannot be measured directly. Psychological research often involves developing screening tools to identify metrics for clinical diagnoses. Let's say you're interested in developing a scale for measuring clinical cases of eating disorders. When developing an eating disorder scale, researchers must establish whether the scale covers the full range of dimensions related to the construct of eating disorders or only parts of it. If, for instance, a proposed eating disorder scale only covers the behavioral aspects of eating disorders and neglects to include cognitive and emotional ones, it lacks content validity and is at risk for research bias. Additionally, in order to achieve content validity, there has to be a degree of general agreement, for example, among experts about what a particular construct represents. Although personality disorder assessments have been used to understand and diagnose different types of personality disorders, they can be criticized for not fully representing the complexity of these disorders. These disorders consist of multiple facets, such as patterns of cognition, affectivity, interpersonal functioning, and impulse control. This means that existing personality disorder assessments might not sufficiently cover all the dimensions of what constitutes personality disorders. To ensure high content validity, assessments should be designed to encompass all aspects and variations of personality disorders rather than focusing narrowly on one or two components. Thus, assessments that fail to do this are considered to have low content validity. Content validity applies to any context where you create a test or questionnaire for a particular construct and want to ensure that the questions actually measure 
what you intend them to. For example, suppose you're researching the mental health needs of older adults through a survey. If your survey questions cover all dimensions of mental well-being, for example, cognitive, emotional, social, and functional abilities, your questionnaire will have high content validity. If some dimensions of mental well-being in older adults are omitted, the results may not provide an accurate indication of geriatric mental health needs. Suppose you're researching addiction tendencies within a community through a questionnaire. If your survey questions cover all aspects of substance abuse, including physical addiction, psychological dependence, social influences, and environmental factors, your questionnaire will have high content validity. If some dimensions of addiction are omitted, the results may not provide an accurate indication of substance abuse within the community. Now we're going to begin the process of how to measure content validity with an example of how to measure content validity correctly for precise evaluation of personality disorders. A high content validity score ensures that the factors contributing to personality personality disorders are measured accurately. Let's break down the process with a detailed example using a fictional scenario of developing a personality disorders assessment tool focused specifically on narcissistic personality disorder. To begin the process of measuring content validity for a personality disorders assessment, we're going to gather input from a panel of mental health professionals, and this would include psychiatrists, psychologists, and therapists. These professionals should have expertise in the diagnosis and treatment of personality disorders. For each question on our assessment, we're going to ask this panel to evaluate whether the content is essential or if it's deemed useful but not essential or if it's deemed not necessary. And this is going to be for accurately diagnosing personality disorders. The consensus on the essential rating indicates higher content validity. We'll use a panel of seven mental health experts to evaluate a question on an assessment for this example. So then we're going to calculate what's called the content validity ratio, the CVR. And this is going to be for each question using this formula, where the CVR is equal to NE, which is the number of panelists indicating that the question is essential, minus N divided by 2, where N is the total number of panelists. And then this quantity, we're going to divide that all by N over 2 again. So to calculate the content validity ratio for this personality disorders assessment, let's say we ask this panel of seven experts to evaluate, and the first question is rated essential by six of these experts then the content validity ratio will be calculated as such. In our numerator, it's going to be 6 minus the quotient of 7 and 2. We'll take this quantity and divide it again by the quotient of 7 over 2. This would equal 0 0.71. Now let's say we repeated this process. So we calculated the CVR for each question pertaining to different aspects of personality disorders. So let's say we went through five more questions, and then we calculated the following CVRs after 0.71. So for question Question two, the CVR was 0 0.45. For question three, it was 0.25. For question four, it was 0.55. For question five, the CVR is 0.65. And for question six, the CVR is 0.75. Please keep in mind that these CVR values are arbitrary and will change based on your research study. We're now going to calculate the content validity index for this assessment. And the content validity index which we'll call CVI, is the mean of all the CVR scores for the questions on our assessment. The closer that the CVI is to 1, the higher the content validity. So here, the CVI, we're going to take 0.71, which is our CVR calculation from the previous slide, and these made up CVRs for questions two through six. Then we're going to divide that by the total number of items, which is six, to get a CVI of 0 0.56. We're then going to refer to this standardized content validity table on the right. It's kind of like the critical values table you've used in the past for degrees of freedom and thresholds for Z, T, chi-square, and F test statistics. Notice how the more panelists that you recruit to assess content validity, the critical value decreases. This makes practical sense if you think of this like having a larger sample size, leading to a higher likelihood of finding a p-value less than 0.05. In other words, the more panelists you use to measure content validity, the easier
easier it is to detect if your construct truly has high content validity. In our example, we only had seven panelists, which means we would have needed to calculate a content validity index of 0.99, which is basically one. And that's to determine if our measure truly has high content validity. Our CVI, which was 0.56, is well below this threshold. And therefore, we conclude that this measure does not accurately measure the assessment of personality disorders. So we'd have to decide to improve the questions with the low CVR in order to get a higher CVI. I want to just make note that this formula yields values which range from positive one to negative one and values above zero indicate that at least half of the subject matter experts agree that this question is essential. The closer to positive one, the higher the content validity. Let's break down the process even more with a detailed example using a fictional scenario of developing a personality disorders assessment tool focused on narcissistic personality disorders still. We'll use a panel of five mental health experts to evaluate three questions. Step one, we're going to collect the data from the experts. The first question is, does the patient exhibit a grandiose sense of self-importance? Our expert ratings were essential, 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 and not necessary. This means that the number indicating essential or NE equals four and capital N, which is the total number of experts equals five. Question two, does the patient often feel envious of others? Our expert ratings, NE equals three, meaning three of our experts rated this as essential. In the last one, does the patient have a history of substance abuse? None of the experts rated this as essential. Using the CVR formula, we're going to calculate each individual CVR. Then we're going to take the average to get the content validity index. For question Question one, the CVR is equal to four minus five divided by two, all divided by five divided by two. Question two, three experts rated it as essential. So it's three minus five divided by two over five divided by two. And lastly, none of our experts rated it as essential. So it's zero minus five divided by two divided by five divided by two, giving us negative one. Step three, we're going to calculate that CVI. Since the CVI is negative and below the critical value for a panel of five experts, and that's using the critical values table from before, where the critical value is 0.99, it suggests that the test does not accurately measure narcissistic personality disorder and improvements are needed. In this example, the negative CVR for question three clearly indicates a lack of agreement among the experts that this question is essential for assessing NPD. It could be a signal to either revise the question or remove it from the assessment tool. Here's the last example. Using a fictional scenario of an assessment tool focused on antisocial personality disorder, we'll use a panel of 10 mental health experts this time to evaluate five questions because we're aiming for a positive result where the content validity index meets that critical value for the table. So we're going to collect the data from the experts. Question one, does the patient show a lack of regard for the feelings or rights of others? Nine of these experts rated this as essential, so NE equals nine. Question two, does the patient engage in impulsive or irresponsible behavior? behavior, NE equals eight. Question three, does the patient exhibit consistent deceitfulness? All 10 experts rated this as essential. Question four, does the patient have a persistent pattern of disregarding social norms and rules? Eight of the experts rated this as essential. And lastly, does the patient show a lack of empathy? Nine experts rated this as essential. So NE equals nine. Using the formula NE minus N over two, all divided by N over two again, the CVR for each question question is 0 0.8, 0 0.6, 1.0, 0 0.6, and 0.8. When we take the average of those CVR scores, we get a CVI of 0 0.76. And comparing the CVI of 0 0.76 with the critical value for the panel of 10 experts, which if I go a couple slides back, for 10 experts, the critical value is 0 0.62. Then our CVI is above the critical value. This means that the questionnaire has high content validity, according to the panel of experts, and accurately measures the intended construct of antisocial personality disorder. This example demonstrates that by ensuring the agreement of experts on the essential nature of each question, it's possible to achieve high content validity for a psychological construct. It's an essential step in developing reliable and effective diagnostic or research tools. Let's shift gears to criterion validity. This is also known as criterion related validity. It's essential in evaluating the effectiveness of diagnostic tools and assessments within clinical psychology because it assesses how accurately a test or tool measures 
the outcome it's designed to. And there's two main types of criterion validity. The first is concurrent validity, and this involves comparing the new measure with the validated criterion at the same time. And then there's predictive validity, and this involves using the new measure to predict future outcomes. I'll go into a couple brief examples, and then in a few slides, I'm going to go into more granular detail on these two subtypes. Schizophrenia is a complex chronic mental health disorder characterized by distorted thinking, hallucinations, delusions, and other severe symptoms. So suppose a researcher is evaluating a new diagnostic tool to detect early symptoms of schizophrenia. The researcher might compare this tool's results with a well-established clinical diagnosis method. If there is a high correlation between the new diagnostic tool and the established method, this demonstrates concurrent validity. For predictive validity, a clinician might use a specific assessment to predict how a patient with schizophrenia will respond to a particular treatment regimen. If the assessment correctly predicts the patient's response to the treatment over time, it demonstrates predictive validity. Let's look at applications to other psychotic disorders that could include delusional disorders, schizoaffective disorders, or more. These disorders share some features with schizophrenia, but are distinct in various ways. So let's look at a concurrent validity example. Let's say there's a new self-report scale designed to assess delusional disorder, and it could be compared with the clinician's structured interview. A high correlation between the self-report scale and the clinician's interview would indicate concurrent validity. For a predictive validity example, suppose a new cognitive cognitive assessment aims to predict how a patient with schizoaffective disorder might progress in a therapeutic program. If the assessment accurately predicts progress, it shows predictive validity. Criterion validity is pivotal in psychiatric research and clinical practice, especially when it comes to psychotic disorders. It helps in ensuring that a test measures what it's intended to measure and is often employed when one wants to replace an established test with a different version. Suppose a psychiatric researcher is developing a shorter version of an existing diagnostic tool for schizoaffective schizophrenia. The original tool, while comprehensive and effective, might be time-consuming and challenging to administer. The researcher wants to evaluate the new shorter form, ensuring it is as effective as the original in diagnosing schizophrenia. Both the new and original tests are administered to a group of patients with schizophrenia. If the results between the two tests correlate highly, such as a correlation of 0.85, the new test demonstrates high concurrent validity. This result indicates that the new test assesses schizophrenia as effectively as the original. For a predictive validity example, let's say the researcher might want to know if the new test can predict the future outcomes of a specific treatment plan for patients with schizoaffective disorder. The researcher correlates the scores from the new test with the patient's progress in therapy over the following months. A high correlation, like 0 0.80, would indicate strong predictive validity, suggesting that the new test accurately predicts treatment outcomes. So how do we measure criterion validity? Well, for establishing concurrent validity, this involves statistically testing the new measurement tool against an established criterion. So for example, a new test for assessing delusional disorder could be correlated with an existing validated tool, and a strong positive correlation indicates concurrent validity. For establishing predictive validity, this involves statistically testing the new tool against future performance or outcomes. For example, a new screening tool for early psychosis could be tested to see if it predicts long-term treatment responsiveness. The statistical evaluation is the correlation coefficient, and Pearson's R will be used to measure the strength of the relationship relationship between the new test and the criterion variable. There are limitations and challenges. There is the gold standard bias. If the gold standard, meaning the established test or measurement that a new test is being compared to is biased or has limitations itself, it can greatly affect the validity of the new test. Its impact in psychotic disorders, for example, if a diagnostic tool used as the gold standard for schizophrenia has certain biases or cultural insensitivities, these flaws might be transferred to a new test that is validated against it. And the solution is to ensure that the gold standard is continually reviewed and refined and employing other types of validity alongside criterion validity. And this should mitigate the issue. And there might not be no established standard for some constructs, particularly for those that are subjective or not well understood. In psychotic disorders, some symptoms might be highly subjective, like the feeling of alienation or certain types of hallucinations, and might not have an objective measurement standard. This makes the criterion validation of a new test for these symptoms challenging. The solution is 
is using multiple methods of validation, combining qualitative and quantitative measures and consulting expert judgments to approach a validation in the absence of a gold standard. There's also confirmation bias. If the new measure and the gold standard are biased in the same way, they might confirm each other, leading to a false sense of validation. In psychotic disorders, for instance, if both a new and existing test for a psychotic disorder overlook certain symptoms that are more prevalent in a particular demographic, they might falsely confirm each other's validity. The solution is utilizing the diverse set of validation methods and ensuring that the tests are reviewed by a broad range of experts that can identify and mitigate this type of bias. We also have temporal issues. Predictive validity requires time to pass between the administration of the test and the observation of the criterion variable. This can make the process lengthy and susceptible to intervening variables. In studying long-term treatment outcomes in schizophrenia, many factors could change over time, confounding the results. This requires careful study design, clear documentation of intervening variables, and robust statistical methods that can help control for these temporal issues. There's also generalizability. The validity established in one population or setting might not necessarily apply to others. A test validated in one cultural or age group might not be universally applicable to all individuals with a psychotic disorder. Conducting validation studies across diverse populations and settings can increase the generalizability of a test. Let's look at the factors influencing the meaningfulness of the criterion correlation. We have the criterion problem, which means that the criterion of interest may be complex and challenging to find. So in mental health, defining what it means to recover from a condition is often subjective and variable, leading to ambiguity. There's criterion contamination, and that's influence of confounding variables. Uncontrolled extraneous variables may be influencing the correlation, attenuating the coefficient rho sub x comma y. For example, an untreated medical condition might influence a study on the effectiveness of a mental health intervention, thereby confounding the results. There's also the unreliability of predictor and criterion. This is due to measurement error, because mistakes in measurement in either the predictor or criterion variable can weaken the correlation. For example, an unreliable scale in assessing anxiety might lead to inconsistency and errors in measuring the treatment effect. There's also sample size and statistical power. Smaller sample sizes lead to a less reliable estimate of the correlation coefficient. For example, a study with a small number of participants may produce results that aren't generalizable or replicable. There's also the restriction of range. This is a population bias because collecting validation data of a clinical instrument on a non-clinical population can bias the correlation as well. For example, using a depression scale on the general population not suffering from depression may lead to misleading conclusions about its validity for clinical use. Let's shift over to concurrent validity, which shows the agreement between two measures or assessments taken at the same time. It involves comparing a new assessment or test with one that's already been validated. This type of validity is essential for ensuring that a new diagnostic tool or intervention is accurately measuring the intended psychological construct. Concurrent validity is a subtype of criterion validity. It is named concurrent because the scores of the new test and the established one are obtained simultaneously. In the realm of forensic psychology, concurrent validity can be crucial in developing tools and assessments that are more efficient, accurate, or specific to particular populations such as sex offenders. Let's say that a forensic psychologist is developing a new risk assessment tool to predict the likelihood of recidivism among sex offenders. The aim is to make this tool more specific to sex offenders, quicker to administer, and more sensitive to certain risk factors. To test the concurrent validity of this new tool, the psychologist would need to compare it to an existing validated assessment for recidivism risk, often considered the gold standard. So step one is selecting your participants. So the researcher would select a sample of convicted sex offenders who are currently under supervision or have been recently released. Step two is administering both assessments. Both the new risk assessment tool and the established validated assessment are administered to the sample at the same time. Step three, comparison of the results. The scores from both assessments are then analyzed to determine how closely they correlate. A strong positive correlation between the two assessments would indicate that the new tool is measuring the same construct, which is recidivism risk, as the validated one. And then lastly, the interpretation. If the results are similar, it can be concluded that the new tool accurately measures the risk of recidivism among sex offenders and possesses concurrent validity. This would allow for confidence in using the new tool in forensic settings, possibly leading to more targeted interventions and monitoring for this specific population. Concurrent and predictive validity are both forms of criterion validity used to validate how a test or assessment aligns with a known standard or criterion. Let's look at an example assessing treatment outcomes in addiction therapy. You're a clinical psychologist specializing in addiction treatment. You're interested in validating a new psychological assessment that measures the likelihood of maintaining sobriety following an addiction treatment program. 
For concurrent validity, let's measure current sobriety. So you administer the new assessment to current patients within the treatment program. Simultaneously, you collect data on their current sobriety status, such as urine tests or self-reports of drug use. You then compare the results from the new assessment with the current sobriety data. If the results correlate strongly, this indicates that the new assessment is valid for measuring current sobriety, demonstrating concurrent validity. Measuring future sobriety, you administer the new assessment to patients at the beginning of the treatment program. After completion of the program, you collect data on their sobriety status, like six months later. You then compare the initial assessment scores with the later sobriety data. If the initial assessment scores correlate with future sobriety, this indicates that the new assessment is valid for predicting future sobriety, demonstrating predictive validity. Both concurrent validity and predictive validity fall under the umbrella of criterion validity, assessing how well a test relates to a known outcome or criterion. While they share common elements, they're applied in different contexts and have distinct features. For concurrent validity, there's the time frame. It measures how well the test scores align with a criterion measured simultaneously or at the same time. It's often used to validate a new test by correlating it with a well-established measure, and it's commonly used in psychological and educational testing, where immediate comparisons are beneficial, whereas predictive validity measures how well the test scores predict a criterion or outcome that will be assessed in the future. It's useful for forecasting future behavior, performance, or outcomes based on current data. It's frequently utilized in selection and recruitment processes, educational admissions, and medical prognosis. Concurrent validity, though valuable, has its set of limitations that researchers and practitioners must be mindful of. There's bias in the gold standard, which means any inaccuracy or bias in the gold standard measure used for comparison can skew the validation process, leading to misleading results. The absence of an unbiased objective criterion makes concurrent validity challenging to establish, potentially limiting its applicability. As concurrent validity assesses current attributes, it may not be suitable for predicting future behavior, potential, or changes over time. And there's potential confounding factors. Simultaneously measuring the criterion may introduce confounding variables that could affect the validity assessment. Predictive validity also has its unique challenges and considerations, such as longer time frames, and this may increase the risk of other intervening variables influencing your outcome. And lastly, data collection challenges. Gathering data at future points can be more complex and costly. In the next video, we're going to transition into measurement error and establishing validity.